Good afternoon and welcome to the American Floral Endowments Grow Pro webinar series. I am your moderator, Karen Schneck. I'm a member of the AFE's Young Professionals Council and a senior research specialist in live goods R&D at Scott's Miracle Grow. I coordinate the annual flower trials for the Scott's Miracle Grow and Bonnie Plants Flower Programs. Today's session is on preparing for Parvis Pinus. On behalf of the endowment, I'm excited to be a part of AFE's Grow Pro webinar series that features a new topic every month presented by an industry expert. The webinars are free to everyone thanks to the generous support of AFE sponsors. The views and opinions expressed in these webinars are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of AFE. As an independent nonprofit, AFE cannot endorse any specific product or opinion. If you are interested in becoming a sponsor for one of our webinars, you can find that information on AFE's website, endowment.org forward slash GrowPro. Today's session was pre-recorded in English by Dr. Sarah Jandrasik. After the presentation, Dr. Jandrasik will join us for a Q&A. Feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A feature or chat at any time. We'll answer as many questions as we can before the end of the hour. Unanswered questions may be answered through a separate email exchange. This session is being recorded and will be shared on AFE's YouTube account. Through AFE's accessibility, through YouTube's accessibility features, you can access closed captions in other languages. To get us started, I'd like to share a bit about today's expert speaker. Dr. Sarah Jandrasik is the Greenhouse Floriculture IPM Specialist for the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, OMAFRA. She works directly with the Ontario growers to help manage pest issues and find research solutions. She has worked continuously in Floriculture IPM for over 25 years. Her career has taken her down the East Coast from New York to North Carolina, and she has worked as Director of Research for an IPM consulting company in Niagara, Ontario. As part of her current position, Sarah runs the On Floriculture blog on floriculture.com to keep growers informed about recent pest control advances and issues facing the industry. Dr. Jandrasik, welcome and thank you for your presentation today on preparing for Parvis Pinus. Thank you so much, Karen, for that introduction. And uh, I'm going to get started with the talk then. So uh, for those of you who might be wondering why someone from Canada is giving you a talk on Thrips Parvus Finus and ornamentals in general, Ontario is actually the fourth largest producer of ornamental crops in North America, um, sort of trading places with Michigan every couple of years for third spot behind Florida and California. And most of our production actually takes place um, in the Niagara region, just across the border from Buffalo. That's where 50% of all Canada's floriculture production is, and that's where I'm stationed. So just to give you some context for the rest of this talk, Canadian greenhouses obviously being in the temperate region, they're fully covered greenhouses, um, usually glass or plastic. We grow a lot of large monoculture crops, and we do have freezing temperatures outside in the winter. Maybe this winter was an exception. It was a bit weird here this year, but usually um, freezing temperatures prevent things like Bamesia whitefly and a lot of um, non-native thrip species from establishing outside. So really our source of these invasive pests are on incoming plant material. Um, so that's a very different challenge than say in Florida where thrips parvus finus is constantly coming in from outside. So this talk will pertain a little bit more to greenhouses in the north um, of the states that are sort of facing the same thing we are of infested cutting material coming in versus you're constantly getting that influx um, from outside populations. So just an update on Thrips Parvus Finus and where it's been found. Uh, a lot of this information has come from uh, Cindy McKenzie at the USDA in Florida, uh, but it was originally from Indonesia, but now is found in over 17 countries. It was found in Florida in 2020, which I'm sure we all remember at this point, and Canada shortly thereafter, again, from imported cutting material. So from all my talks with Canadian regulators, it's unlikely to be a regulated pest in Canada because it can't overwinter here because of those outside freezing temperatures. But it is still a quarantine pest in Florida, as far as I know, um, and a pest of concern by the USDA, which means uh, shipping plants from Canada into the US with um, 
visible parvus minus would obviously be a no-no. And it's also been found more in other states and different provinces in Canada. We've had reports um, unofficial of it being in British Columbia and Quebec. Um, the other states are highlighted and the action in those states is, is currently uncertain at this point. So basically the point of this talk is like the title says, preparing you for parvus finus by trying to give you all the information I know to date. Um, and this is based on uh, some work done in the States, mostly focused on pesticide screening and um, some monitoring. Uh, Ontario's work is focused on on-farm trials of both these pesticides, monitoring how does it work and you know, preliminary studies on biocontrol. There's also been some limited biocontrol trials in the Netherlands. And just as a bit of uh, good news stuff up front, uh, the Netherlands, um, Georgia, Florida, and Ontario, there are a lot of in-depth projects happening next year. We've all gotten funding. Um, so I think the next two years is really gonna bring us a lot of uh, effective strategies for this pest besides pesticides. So that's, I'm looking forward to that. And I'm sure a lot of you are too. So some of the lessons we've learned from Canada, first of all, damage can look very different on different crops. So this is the current host list um, that I've gotten uh, by uh, amalgamating what we see up here in Canada, as well as talking to consultants throughout the US. Obviously the top ones are Gardenia, uh, Anthuriums, uh, and Mandevilla and Diplodenia, as well as Schefflera. And I've sort of ordered them in terms of uh, damage and importance. But we are finding them pop up on some, some weird ones. Uh, you heard it here first, but they do attack poinsettia. So I'm a little nervous for this year's uh, poinsettia season. Um, but some of these like, uh, you know, sweet alyssum, periwinkle poinsettia, Gerber daisies, um, some of these we think might be happening because the thrips is sort of like bouncing from a crop it does like and reproduces well on and just booping over to these other crops and being like, oh, I guess I'll eat you too whether or not they really like them and would really be damaging to them if there wasn't this like movement back and forth from uh, high level ones is a little bit unknown at this point. So that's one thing um, we've definitely noticed is they also seem to be not only species specific for plant hosts, but also very variety specific. So that's something to keep in mind. And so far we're not seeing them pop up on any of the other really big ones of concern that were on their potential host list, like things like chrysanthemums, that would kind of be a disaster. We're not seeing that. So, so far this is the list with, like I said, sort of scored from most important and most damaging at the top to sort of like, uh, these might just be like a opportunistic uh, infestation near the bottom. So we know about this pest that it's mainly a foliage feeder. It will obviously feed on the pollen and nectar within flowers and will cause some scarring on the flowers but it's mostly interested in the growing points of plants. And generally this looks a lot like heavy broad mite damage. So the new leaves and buds become brittle, um, the leaves become distorted, we get this heavy brown scarring and often new leaves abort. But on some plants, it actually looks a lot like uh, Western flower thrips damage or just typical thrips damage as opposed to this kind of more broad mighty damage. So something like hibiscus shown here, that could be Western flower thrips. So it is important to monitor, which we'll talk about later and, and confirm what pest species you have. So here's just a few more photos of some of the more like weird hosts that we've seen recently. Ipamea, for example, we're just noticing leaf crinkling more than anything. Um, Vinca, you get a little bit of leaf distortion, but also petal streaking. Prayer plants, you get this really interesting damage going up one side of the leaf where the leaf is uh, rolled um, before it's fully open. And then poinsettia, these pictures are kind of scary, but that looks like sort of like heavy, heavy thrips feeding, um, like heavy echinothrips feeding or something. And that was from a grower in Europe that was surrounded by pepper fields. So what he thinks happened is the parvus minus flew in from peppers and attacked his poinsettia crop. And so far the industry losses, um, we know that in Indonesia, 23% of their chili pepper crop is lost each year due to this pest, which is pretty significant. I understand in Florida, it was a significant pest in peppers, sort of the first year it was found before we knew what to do with it. And that one grower lost up to $3 million. But my understanding is it's more under control in that crop now. So really we're getting hammered on the ornamental side of things. So some numbers from Ontario, that, from growers who've been willing to share that information with us. 
Uh, Mandeville or Diplodenias, um, the first year it was president of Ontario, a grower lost 60% of his crop, which was around two and a half million dollars. Um, but we've sequentially gotten that down to 20% losses in 2023 and expect only 10% losses this year. So that's good news. Other growers, um, anthuriums have lost over $160,000, but we really just don't know the full impact of this pest unless growers report these numbers to us. So the second lesson we've learned is monitoring is time consuming, but is incredibly critical for this pest. And you have to monitor at the vegetative stage because by the time you wait to look for flowers, it's too late. And both myself and work done in Florida, we figured out that plant taps are the best method to do this. So beating the plants over a white pan or sheet and then counting the adults and larvae. And that's because um, this method reveals thrips before the damage can even show. And taps have been shown to be highly correlated with damage, whereas just in, in like assessing the flowers is not. And also this is a very patchy thrips. I find it bouncier rather than it flies long distances. So um, plant taps can help you determine the distribution in the crop. Is it just at this one end of your greenhouse? Is it just in this one variety? Things like that. So you're doing your plant tapping, right? And then you've got a whole bunch of dark thrips that are coming out. So ever since we've started talking about Parvus finus, growers have bring, been bringing me baggies and vials and sticky cards of dark thrips being like, is this Parvus finus? Oh my goodness. Um, so not every dark thrips is a Parvus finus, just, just to ease your mind a little bit, especially in tropicals. So, um, you know, for those of you that grow tropicals and are experienced with thrips, which of these is Parvus finus? I'll give you a little second to answer. Maybe you want to put it in the chat function. Um, if you answered C, you were correct. And one of the big distinguishing features is these other thrips have a very, like all over dark bodies, their head, their thorax, and their abdomen. Whereas thrips parvus finus, um, the head and the thorax and the top of that, the, you know, the, the top part of their thorax tends to be lighter and the abdomen is very, very dark. But probably the best way to identify these thrips is through um, a, an identification key that both OMAFRA, uh, the Ministry of Ag where I work, and the Vineland Research and Innovation Center have made together. And it's a little cartoon uh, ID key. So if you don't think thrips are cute in real life, maybe you'll think the cartoons are cute. Um, but we'll drop this in the a link to this in the chat um, while we're doing this presentation. But basically, this is a key we've designed to be really usable for growers. We've had it tested. Um, you do need a microscope, that might be the only caveat, um, but it's a real simple way to detect which species you have on your farm without necessarily having to send it out. So the reason you monitor is obviously to detect the thrips in your greenhouse, but also to establish thresholds. Um, we often say in ornamentals like, oh, our threshold is zero. And we all know that's not true. And establishing thresholds is really important to both avoid economic damage from this pest, but also prevent resistance. We don't just wanna be calendar spraying for this pest. That's not gonna work for us long-term. We're going to hit resistance. We've already hit resistance with certain chemicals in Ontario that I'll talk about later. So doing these taps and, and creating thresholds allows you to do things like only spray varieties that need it or when thresholds are reached. And that ultimately is cheaper because spraying and labor for that is expensive. Um, and as I mentioned, thresholds are not going to be zero, but for this thrips, they are going to be very, very low compared to other thrips. Basically what we figured out here in Ontario is for something like Mandevilla with these really sensitive growing points, it's around one to two thrips per plant maximum. And this is obviously going to vary by crop also by plant stage and size, and also how close you are to shipping. Obviously, we'll need to clean it up before you ship. Um, and we recommend using every tool avail available to you. So the taps, but as well as cards and damage metrics for this pest. So kind of what would this look like for you? I've really been thinking a lot about how I've taken everything from the past couple of years and like what information can I pass on that a grower could start building a monitoring program with. So there's sort of um, two phases of this kind of, um, if you're starting clean. So for example, we have a Mandevilla grower um, here in Ontario that supplies some of the other Mandevilla uh, people who finish the crop and his mother stock is clean, but the facilities that do the finishing, they have 
uh, parvus vine is coming out on other tropicals like anthurium, things like that, or Hoya. So when they're growing the mandevilla, it, the monitoring is a little bit different here when you know it's clean to start with than it would be if you knew you were bringing those cuttings in dirty. So for example, uh, what my colleague, Judy Colley from Plant Products does is she walks the crop and looks for damage, but then she also taps five to 10% of each variety. And this is kind of a metric we figured out works for monitoring for Bamesia white fly and poinsettia. You can't tap the whole crop, right? So five to 10% can give you a really good snapshot as long as you do each variety because of that susceptibility differences by variety. Um, you also want to use uh, trap plants, and I'll talk more about this later, but we found that sweet alyssum, uh, the variety uh, Giga White, works really, really well. It's more attractive to thrips than the crop. So we use that as a monitoring plant. We stick a big sticky card in that. So she checks that weekly as well. She taps the plant, she checks the card. And then if she finds more than two live adults in any variety, that variety gets um, treated. And she's found that Lalgard M52, which is microbial insecticide, works really well to clean things up. And then she goes back to her regular monitoring after that. The difference uh, is, is a little bit uh, drastic when you know the cuttings are coming in dirty. So you have to put a bit more effort into monitoring here because it's less about just detecting anything and more about seeing how much you have and when you should spray. So um, this is the metrics I worked out for the cuttings with the grower that I'm working with. The cuttings are coming from Guatemala infested already. So we've sort of figured out that we should stop and spray if any of the following are happening. So any sudden increase on cards, at least 50% from last week. So you're going from two thrips per card per week on average to three, that tells you your population's going up and you need to do something. Um, again, tap five to 10% of each variety. And if you reach a, an average of one thrips per plant, you should be doing something. So for smaller pots, four to seven inch pots or early growth, it's more like if you reach 10 thrips at any point when sampling 20 plants. So that would be an average of half a thrips per plant. You should definitely spray, but older plants can handle a bit more and the threshold would be more like one thrips per plant. And then the third thing we've realized is you can't just go on the thresholds. I'll show you more data later this year where we had you know, under two thrips per plant and we thought we were golden. But when we actually looked at the damage, like in this picture on the right, the plants just weren't growing, which tells us there's probably more thrips there. So if you're finding damage on more than one fifth of the plants, especially on these growing points, you need to do something to allow the plant to grow. Um, so in this example, you know, two of the leaders of this mandevilla were growing really nicely. And then the, the stuff in the red circle was just like, nope, which is telling us that growing point was being attacked and there was significant thrips pressure, even though the tap outs were pretty low. So why such low thresholds and why do the taps not always work? Well, the gold standard with thrips um, monitoring is actually plant washes where you take um, you destructively sample the plant and you shake it up in a, in a jar and pour it through a sieve and then count the thrips on the filter paper. We're working on a video of how to do this. Um, so that'll be on my blog uh, later um, when we've, we probably will finish it in April. Um, so someone can put in the link to my onfloraculture.com blog in the chat. That would be great. Uh, it's got lots of good resources. But anyway, basically what we, we figured out with plant taps versus washes is the larvae of, of uh, harvest minus are really sticky for lack of a better term, they do not tap out. So for example, on the left here, you can see um, if we just went by the taps in Mandevilla, it looks like 100% of the population is adults. But when we actually do a wash, we were missing about 60% of the population present there as larvae. And the same was true in our alyssum tap, uh, trap plants as well. Um, so that's why the thresholds are low, because even if we're saying it's one per plant that are tapping out, it's, that's probably more like three per plant um, with the adults and larvae that are washing out or being tapped out. So the last thing I'll say about monitoring um, is that it's incredibly important to visualize the data, actually having someone graph it over time, especially if you're doing management tactics and you want to see if they're working. Um, and it needs to be in a format where it can be shared with people easily. So like, again, an ex like if you've got someone on your farm, you can enter things into Excel and knows how to graph, great. And then send that graph weekly to people. 
This is an example of an on-farm trial we were doing with a grower. We sprayed in late November. We were getting great control. Um, the, the orange line is plant taps. The blue line is our monitoring cards. And you can see after we sprayed, except for a bit of a peak on the cards right after we sprayed, everything was down to almost zero until into the spring in February. And at that point we had gotten a bit complacent. We're like, oh, we sprayed, we cleaned it up. Like maybe we eradicated it, you know? And then the scout uh, was taking information and knew it was increasing, but that data was just on a piece of paper and no one really had context for what that meant versus what we were doing before. So as soon as we graphed it, we were like, ooh, <laughs> we need to spray. And then we were probably a little bit late on spraying as you can see from the end of the graph. So that's why this is so important. Even someone like me, you know, who does this stuff all the time, you can miss it if it's not screaming out at you on a graph. Pages on a number just don't mean much. And if you don't really know how to do that yourself with Excel, there are lots of programs nowadays uh, where you can enter data and it'll spit out a report. I'm gonna highlight two Canadian products, obviously. Um, so this first one is Bug Vision. So this is kind of what the interface looks like. Um, so it, you know, you can see the little dots of like, when you've monitored, I put the spray in there, but you can see how the thrips numbers go down over the spray. You can also see we were at around one thrips per card before we sprayed, but it was in an upward trajectory. We got, we got to four thrips per card per week. So we knew we had to do an intervention. And then after we sprayed, everything went back down to around one thrips per card. So there's these other options too. Talk with your biocontrol supplier and see if they have um, one of these uh, scouting software interfaces for you, because a lot of them do now. Okay, so our third lesson learned is that mechanical and cultural controls are very important for this pest. We know these are part of the IPM toolbox, but we don't tend to talk about them a lot. We talk about biological control and chemical control, and we forget how useful these can be. And like with Carve's Finest, it's really like all hands on deck, all tools in the toolbox kind of pest. So you will make your life easier by using these, promise me or I promise you. <laughs> um, so sticky cards are the first one we found is really, really beneficial. Uh, both myself and Judy at Plant Products have figured out in our two facilities and two crops that we've been doing that they are accounting for about 17 to 30% of control. And that's huge, right? Something you have to put up once per crop cycle and you're getting 30% control. Um, the color of card you want to pick varies by your geographical location, your greenhouse covering, basically because it, the card attractiveness depends on light quality. Um, so it's really important to do quick and dirty tests on your own farm, I would say for at least two weeks. And both, I would do it both in the summer and in the winter because the light quality is different. So for example, at the facility I'm working in, we did tests of yellow, white, green, and two different blue, shades of blue, because blue can vary a lot, whereas the yellows and the whites are obviously pretty standard. Um, we had heard from the Netherlands that green were really attractive. And in our tests in the summer, we found yellow was the best. They caught the highest proportion of thrips here, which is what's being shown. But interestingly, in the winter, the darkest blue card we could find was actually the most attractive. So we flipped out our cards um, based on the time of year. Another one that um, is being used in the Netherlands and Judy was also using at the facility she was at is landscape cloth or strawberry cloth. It's made specifically to allow light and air transfer and humidity um, to transfer through the cloth, but not pests. Um, so Judy used it to protect Hoya, which she noticed was getting attacked in this facility that had the, the infested anthurium. And again, it was a case of that just like booping over, like would they normally eat, be excited about Hoya? Maybe not if they weren't growing right next to anthuriums. Um, so instead of treating the Hoya regularly with pesticides or biocontrol agents, what they decided to do is just grow the Hoya under the strawberry cloth. And it's been incredibly clean. Uh, the Netherlands is experimenting with hanging the, the landscape cloth between bays of different varieties or different plants um, at hip height. Because again, these thrips are very bouncy. I, I feel like they don't fly very much. So obviously that applies if you're growing on the floor. If you were growing on a bench, you'd have to hang it maybe two or three feet uh, over the crop height. And the alternative to this, if you're like, ooh, I don't wanna fuss around with landscape cloth, 
is to really think about controlling your workflow. This has helped so much in both the facilities that we've worked in. Um, for example, in the facility I was working in, the first year we did Mandevilla, this farm also grew hibiscus, but they grew them in separate compartments separated by like a huge concrete walkway. And in that year, you know, the Mandevilla were a little bit of a hot mess, but the hibiscus barely had any parvus finus on them. And they really just needed one pesticide cleanup at the end. And the rest of the time we could use our normal biocontrol program for things like white fly and spider mites and regular thrips. Um, so that was really beneficial. The second year for, uh, you know, whatever reason, space reasons, probably the, they grew the hibiscus and the mandevilla in adjoining compartments. And, you know, thrips don't respect doors super much. They also move with employees. They can get stuck to your clothing. So in that year, we basically had to spray the hibiscus almost from the get-go. And we think there was transfer going back and forth. So finally, we moved the hibiscus over again to a separate compartment and things have settled down a little bit. So think about that. Think about your workflow. Don't have workers move from areas of high infestation or highly susceptible plants to low. Um, and if you can separate out your plantings by susceptibility, um, I think that's the way to go. The other cultural control you might want to think about using is trap plants that I mentioned at the beginning. Alyssum was the one that we found worked best. So this is a graph of the crop. So Mandevilla is the blue line. Alyssum is the orange line. Um, we had set our economic threshold to around 15 thrips per plant. These were large Mandevilla held over from last year. Um, and this is like the number of thrips per week. And you can see that the second week we put out alyssum trap plants, the number of thrips um, in the screen box was higher on the alyssum, twice as high than on the mandevilla. So that means they're over two times more attractive than the crop they're attacking, which is great. That's where you want a trap plant to be. Uh, unfortunately, notice week three and four, things are just exploding on the alyssum, which shocked us a little bit. Uh, we didn't know it was a host plant at the time. So what this told us was um, the thrips, parvus finus, were reproducing on the trap plant. So that's the danger, right? You want a trap plant that will be more attractive and suck them off. But if it can reproduce on them, then you either need to spray them every two to three weeks, two weeks being their um, life cycle, right? So you want to spray the plants before new adults are formed and then fly off back into your crop because then they would, the plants would actually end up turning into a source of thrips rather than a sink of thrips, right? So you can either spray them with pesticides every two weeks or you can bag them up and throw them out um, and put new ones in there, which is a lot of labor, um, but can be effective. So you could see at the end of this trial, when we actually did spray the plants first and then threw them out and replaced them with new ones, that was the first time where the thrips pressure on the mandevilla actually dropped well below our threshold. So we did think this was a really promising tool. If you don't have the time or space to be growing all these um, a sweet alyssum, you can just grow a couple and use them as indicator plants. So this is what Judy Colley has been doing at her facility in the mandevilla that are clean, but are at risk from the parvus finus coming in from other crops. Uh, she's planted or placed one of these um, at the end of each variety and then uses it as an indicator plant. So I think this is really smart. And then uh, lastly, uh, a cultural control you can do, I mentioned it before, is variety selection. There is huge side-by-side -side differences in both anthurium and mandevilla with this pest. I'm sure that's true of other crops as well. But you can see on this picture here on the left, this was before pesticide intervention, but you could see this variety in the forefront is just not looking good at all. And the one right beside it was like, sure, we can still keep growing even though we've got some parvus finus. And then after pesticide treatment, you can see the one on the, the left grew out of the parvus finus damage very well. And the other one still doesn't look super hot. So, you know, we want varieties that can withstand the damage and also grow out of damage easily. So the next lesson we learned is about biocontrol and we know it's going to be very different than our biocontrol programs with Western flower thrips. And for those of you interested in more information on Western flower thrips control and also botrytis control, two of the major things we we encounter and have to deal with in the greenhouse floriculture industry, um, AFE has a great 
library of information and talks on that. So go to the AFB website. Uh, also, if the moderator could pop that in the chat right now, that would be super helpful. But yeah, for Parvis Finest, this isn't going to be your, your mama's uh, biocontrol program for thrips. It's going to be radically different. So we're going to start with a success story um, because let's stay positive. So Judy was working with an anthurium grower. And after several years, I think she started in uh, around 2021 20, uh, working on this. Um, she found just like I did in the Mandevilla that predatory mites are not effective. We don't know what it is about this thrips yet that makes mites not effective for it. It, it could be that they're too fast. They're, they're bonkers fast, faster than any other thrips I've ever seen. Um, there's also some research coming out of the Netherlands that maybe this thrips also predates on um, threat or um, predatory mite eggs. So that could be part of it, or there could be some other factors we just don't know about yet. So she tried a bunch of mites first, both Kikumers and Swirsky, they did not work. So other information coming out of BioBest in Belgium was supporting um, the idea that bigger bios might be better. So like Aureus, Lacewings, uh, things like that. So what she, what she did was uh, release a high level, level of Aureus, so 0.5 per square foot or 5.5 per meter squared, along with hypoaspis at planting. And she did weekly releases of the Aureus. The idea is you're not hoping they establish, we're not growing peppers here, right? We don't have a lot of good pollen sources for Aureus. Um, so you're just releasing them weekly, which means they can work in the winter because if you're releasing the adults weekly, you don't have to worry about reproductive diapause. Those Aureus that you release will have babies. It's those babies that will go, like won't um, have uh, reproduce when they turn into adults afterwards. So you're going for weekly releases and just don't worry about them establishing. And she also used the mass trapping as I talked about before. And her outcome was that this was very successful over the whole year, but still expensive at these rates of Aureus. And they still had some unsellable varieties. So they chose not to grow these growing forward. Again, combining biocontrol with a cultural control. So then in 2023, their best year yet, they were actually able to drop the rate of Aureus to 2.5 per meter squared. And how they did this was they, um, when the cuttings first came in, knowing they were coming in dirty, they sprayed them with success or conserve, so the pesticides phenocid, and then treated them with Lalgard M52, which is a microbial insecticide, um, in propagation, and then started the Aureus um, at potting up. And that's been a lot more um, economically feasible for them, which is great news. So uh, for the next few slides, I'm gonna talk about biocontrol in uh, Mandevilla when they're coming in dirty, just like the anthuriums going to be a little bit less of a success story, but we're, we're getting some positive, you know, movement going forward, which is good. So this year, building on stuff we did the last couple of years, we wanted to do um, two programs, sort of uh, like a high and a low cost one. The low cost one would incorporate more microbials. The high cost one would be more like Judy's program. We're raising a lot of big bios. And we really wanted to give this a chance. So we wanted to use really high rates of biocontrol agents. Um, and I really have to give a shout out to BioB here um, because we weren't, these are rates we use that would not be feasible for a grower. We just wanted to say like, okay, what if we went bigger, went home, would this work? And so BioB allowed us to do that by donating product. Um, we use all big bios, as I mentioned, because um, our previous attempts with predatory mites, we never got below a threshold of 10 thrips per plant. And as I mentioned before, we knew it's much lower than this. We decided to use minimal pesticide use, except for spot sprays and some of those varieties that seem to harbor a lot of Parvus finus. And we had a drop dead date of December 1st if this was not working. So we would turn to a chemical program. The cuttings come in in like July, August. So we basically got August to December 1st to play around with biocontrol and then go for, to a spray program and the plants are sold in uh, April, May. So uh, unfortunately we had a few issues. So like your normal thrips control program, what you would do is a high amount of bios in propagation where the plants are tight together and you know thrips are coming in on the plant material and then you would move to other strategies when they move out of propagation. So we wanted to do that, but unfortunately this, um, uh, tenting the, the cuttings, which is how mandevilla are often grown to keep the humidity and temperature high, 
the temperatures were just too high for any of the biocontrol agents to survive. We had data loggers in there and it was over 35 degrees Celsius, which I think is around 90 Fahrenheit. Um, so none of the bios are gonna work in that under those conditions, including the microbials. The microbials also tap out at these temperatures. Uh, and this is unfortunate. And we did also dip our unrooted cuttings, which again is a strategy we use for Western flower thrips. And that'll be in that AFA library on thrips and botrytis control. Um, it works really well for white fly and thrips and to a certain extent spider mites. Um, but when we actually looked at the dip water from the cuttings we were getting from, from Guatemala, um, we found very few adults or larvae in the dip water, which tells us the thrips were coming in as eggs. Um, so uh, that just means it's, you know, we start have to target larvae um, uh, in that situation. So our initial dips didn't really, you know, reduce much of the pests. The eggs are embedded in the plant tissue. They're not really affected by dips unless you're gonna dip in landscape oil and the mandibular cuttings are too weak when they're unrooted to dip in oil. Um, and then, you know, our plans to do biocontrol and propagation also didn't work out because of the temperatures. So what we ended up doing was once the cuttings were rooted and about to be potted, we dipped them in oil then when we, they could handle it. And this did reduce thrips by 70%, but wasn't the level of control we were hoping for. Um, so with that little preface of sort of what went wrong, um, our first program, as I mentioned before, was gonna be high bios, like high rates of biocontrol agents, plus trap plants. So this is gonna be expensive in terms of the product and also in terms of labor. So what we were doing is releasing around four aureus per meter squared weekly. We did reduce this to two per meter squared a little later. We also had a theta in there and hypoaspis. We had one trap plant per 50 crop plants, which is a lot of alyssum plants. And it did look really promising in terms of numbers. We set our economic threshold to five thrips per plant, having started with 10 thrips per plant the previous year and knowing that wasn't gonna cut it. So we moved it down to five. And other than this one little blip in week 39, where we had a little bit of a spike, um, where, which we were able to combat just by washing the thrips off the plants with a heavy watering. Things were looking pretty good. The alyssum was around 2.5 to six times more attractive than the crop. Uh, we were flipping those out well. And through the fall, we were under four thrips per plant on average. Um, and it, this was close to two thrips per plant um, throughout a lot of it. So this looked really promising. I'll get to the end result a little bit later. But first I'll show you our second program, which is the cheaper program. So a low amount of bios plus microbials. So we sort of did this in different phases because we kind of didn't know what would work and what would not. Uh, initially we did um, low rates of aureus, so two per meter squared along with a theta and hypoaspis weekly. And you can see we started at a bit above five thrips per plant. Again, that was our action threshold or economic threshold after we dipped the the, thrip, or the cuttings in oil. So we did do um, a treatment with DDVP or dichlorovos and a heat treatment. We allowed the greenhouse to heat up to 45 degrees Celsius for a few hours, which we had learned in previous years could really decimate some of the thrips populations. Um, so we started back around zero when we put the biocontrol agents in. But unfortunately, you can see that shortly after we put the bios in, the numbers just started spiking again. So phase two was us doing high rates of Bioseries EC, which is one of the, the microbial pesticides that Alexandra Ravinthi's work from Florida identified as like a potentially really great tool in her lab assays. But on farm, we did not find that this worked. You can see the white variety really exploded with thrips purpose finest. And we had 85 thrips on like a poor little 12 inch pot on average. So um, I give all the credit to the grower for continuing to try with biocontrol at this point. So we were able to rescue this crazy situation <laughs> with sprays of Lalgard MET 52. Um, high rates applied weekly, sometimes twice a week, as well as we added in Anistis, which is a large predatory mite species, um, mostly available in Canada right now, I believe. Um, but we had done trials with it a few years ago showing it's a really effective predator in the winter, or seems to be. Um, we need some follow-up studies on this, but the combination of MET52, Anistis, putting in a bunch of blue trapping cards now that it was winter, really seemed to bring most of these varieties under control in just a few weeks. All of this white variety, which is the green line, 
which was the bane of our existence. We did have to go in with softer chemical sprays in that variety. So we did Rimon, uh, which is pedestal in the US as well in combo with Belief, um, which is Aria. And you can see we got down to back to almost zero there. So the take home message of this program was definitely that microbials can effectively reduce an outbreak and should be considered as part of your rotation program. And it allows you to continue biocontrol. But really the sum up of this whole program was that we made progress, but was it successful yet? No. Um, the thrips pressure, both programs I showed you, they reduced thrips to under five thrips per pot, which was our goal, but, um, and that was much lower than previous attempts we did with any predatory mites. But the problem is both had significant amount damage of damage that the plants weren't growing. Um, so we had to switch to sprays in December, the same as we did the previous year due to lack of growth. So obviously the actual damage threshold is much lower than five thrips per plant, which is why I showed you that threshold stuff at the beginning, uh, where it's basically one per plant in tap outs. So if we had done that, I think we would have intervene sooner with softer chemicals and maybe still done the biocontrol. Um, but still biocontrol was doing more than we've ever had it do, um, which is really promising. So if we can get in there with some soft chemicals, maybe together those can work. Remember, you can't use microbial pesticides with aureus. It's very susceptible to things like botanogard, bioseries, and F52. And in terms of cost, neither program was economically feasible yet. Um, in the Mandevilla, it is economically feasible, what I showed you from Judy's work in the Anthurium. But we are seeing enough success that we're going to continue it this year. There are big production change we're making, besides that workflow stuff I was talking about with the hibiscus versus the Mandevilla, is um, not tenting the propagation material and really focusing our high rates of biocontrol agents there, along with some softer chemicals to try to clean up the prop right at the beginning and then uh, put more like preventative biocontrol on afterwards in a more economically feasible way. And just for those of you who might be wondering like, why is it successful in Anthurium and not successful in Mandevilla when the cuttings are coming in dirty? And honestly, it just, these crops are so different. Um, the architecture is really different. The growing period is really different. Um, Anthuriums don't have as much pollen and nectar um, in their flowers and the flowers develop really late versus Mandevilla. They can flower really early. Uh, there seem to be more stronger varietal differences in Anthurium where if you drop out those highly susceptible varieties, it's way easier to manage. With Mandevilla, there's maybe like a couple standout varieties, but it's not as black and white. Um, and also with Mandevilla, often the plants are grown at a low temperature over the winter to sort of keep them growing at a like slow and steady pace and then really take off in the spring. And that kind of worked against us in this case, because uh, research out of the Netherlands has shown that Parvus finus will keep trucking along at seven degrees Celsius, um, but our biocontrol agents really don't do well below 20 degrees. Most of them, Anistis maybe will do well, you know, around 10 degrees Celsius. So we were basically, basically dropping the temperature. What it did was it, you know, gave, the thrips were fine, the bios were not fine, and then the plants couldn't put on enough growth to outpace the damage in Mandevilla. So I think that's one of the biggest differences. So this year, I think one of the reasons we only have 10% losses due to versus 20% losses from last year is because we pushed the temperatures higher over the fall and winter this year to try and push the plants uh, through that growth phase um, a little better to outpace the thrips damage. So here's a little summary chart of what we think is working in terms of bios in the green bars um, or rows, uh, the maybes in the blue and the we really are positive these are not working in the orange or red. Uh, so we know the big bios, things like aureus, lacewing, anistis are working. The only problem here is this can be really, really expensive. So for example, I've just highlighted in red some of the, the bonkers rates that people have found effective. Like it's great that we can find effective rates, but what does that mean? when you have to use 200 lace wing eggs per plant, is that doable? Or even, you know, 10 to 20 aureus per plant. Like, can we do that as an industry? I don't think we can. Um, but maybe if we use it along with other strategies, we can get those numbers down. And people always ask me, you know, what do I think about nematodes, all these other things? The answer is we just don't know yet. We need some more um, lab trials really investigating this to tease out. When you're doing a big biocontrol program, 
in a commercial operation and sort of doing the spaghetti at the wall sort of scenario, it's really hard to tease out who's contributing what. Um, so that's why we need some of the more of these projects that are going to be more lab based coming out of Ontario and, and Florida and the Netherlands and things like that. So I realize we're running a little bit short on time. Uh, so I'm just gonna sort of whiz through this pesticide section. Just a quick note that Alexandra Ravinzi from the University of Florida, she's done most of the work and her article on conventional and biorational pesticides is open access. So someone will drop that into the link and you can look at that. We've found um, on farm trials, uh, confirm that most of the pesticides she's tested do in fact work. We've got an A team and a B team. Um, the idea is with the A team and the B team, you should be rotating these together. The B team is mostly for larvae. The A team affects mostly adults and, and larvae together. Um, so make sure you're rotating them uh, to prevent resistance. And unfortunately we found ones that didn't really work super well. Uh, belief for area, which Alexandria confirmed. Sphere T, which is a new product, which is a spider venom, venom uh, based insecticide. We didn't really get very many good results at all with that. Ferrance Mainspring is on Alexandria's list as effective, but we found it did suppression only. And BioSeries EC didn't seem very effective for us on farm, but we were also doing things in the fall so that, you know, try it out on your own farm at different times of year. It might be a, a bit better results. Um, when to use these? Uh, you want to do the biorationals, things like the soaps and oils and microbials. Uh, in propagation, again, to target larvae, since we know they're coming in mostly as eggs, probably because the propagators are spraying enough to get rid of the adults and larvae, but not the eggs that are embedded into the tissue. But you can also move up to soft chemicals as well for the larvae. So things like Rimon, Conto, Sparens, even something like Pylon, which is toxic, but has a short residual. So you could do biocontrol after this. So then in late production and finishing, this is when you want to switch to more of the big guns if you're over threshold and have adults present. But just note that once you've gone to these chemicals, you will be finishing with chemicals. You won't be able to do biocontrol with a program like this. And pesticide rotation is going to be really critical. Um, you don't want to use the same mode of action or that IRAC number in sequential windows, a window essentially being one generation of the pest. So if you want more information on that, there's a QR code um, you can snap a picture of that'll take you to these kinds of examples for pesticide resistance management. Uh, we can also drop a link in the chat for this as well. And uh, if you're not sure how to make a rotation program yourself, JC Chong, who does the Pest Talks newsletter, um, which you should fully subscribe to for sure, he's done uh, a handy dandy rotation chart for adult parvus minus, nymphal parvus minus, and if you find them both together. So that's also important to know what life stage you have. So you know what pesticides to pick and he's broken that down for you. And Judy and I are working on a Canadian version of this since we don't have all the chemicals that you guys do. And just another example on farm, this was a rotation program we used in 2022 in the Mandevilla that worked really well. And one thing I just wanna note is we did two different varieties. The gray line is a white variety, the orange line is a red variety. And you can see that after we did the first application of successor spinosad in December, we got 16 weeks control with that in that variety. So we didn't need to spray that variety again. And that also helps with resistance management, not doing blanket wide sprays uh, through your whole farm. And this is again, where I say maybe like Ferentz didn't work that well for us um, because you can see the red started to sort of tick back up in March. We did a couple applications of Ferentz or Mainspring. It sort of suppressed it. Um, but didn't get us where we needed it to be. So we had to come back in with uh, Pylon and then Avid to clean that crop up. So overall, our sort of strategy for IPM going forward in Mandevilla is gonna be dipping the cuttings at receipt, reducing thrips and propagation with softer pesticides, microbials and biocontrol, then dipping the rooted cuttings before potting in oil, which we know kills adults, larvae and eggs within the tissue, initiate biocontrol, mass trapping, cultural controls at potting, then delaying pesticide applications as much as we can to avoid resistance, and then potentially reintroducing bios and then cleaning up at the end with um, pesticides. Um, and just remember to develop a rotation program at the beginning so that you're not rushing to figure out what you need to be doing uh, uh, and make sure it's a rotation program that will get you from propagation through to sale.
And with that, I just want to promote my On Soar Culture blog, where we're sharing a lot of Parvis Finest resources. So subscribe to that. You'll get a post maybe once every two weeks. Um, I want to thank everyone that helped me with this information for the Grow Pro webinar series. Um, Judy from Plant Products, BioB, Applied Binomics, all the assistance from my summer students and uh, grower cooperators for letting us on farm. Lastly, I just want to uh, bring to your attention uh, the next Grow Pro talk, which will be on peat shortages, which is really interesting to every one of us in the industry. And with that, we'll go to questions. Wonderful. So Dr. Jan Jusrik, thank you so much for your presentation. And it's time to open it for Q&A. And we had quite a few come through. So let's get started. OK, so one of the first questions we got, um, talking about microscopes. Sarah, is there a microscope that you recommend? Um, the person who asked this question had some trouble finding something that was good quality. Yeah, uh, we're going to be putting this information on the blog. So if you go on my blog to Thrips Identification and then go to Thrips Identification Workshop Resources, we're actually probably this month going to be putting a microscope buying guide there because it's really less about the brand and more about the magnification. So you want one that's at least 40 to 45 X um, binocular, like two lenses instead of one, mm -hmm. and to be able to adjust certain things. So I, I promise you that resource will be available. Man. I need to check out your website. That sounds so cool. <laughs> Let's see. Um, we have a question. Have you tested any other entomopathogenic fungi like Bavaria or Isaria? Um, I haven't. I know Alexandra's uh, paper looked at or different um, projects she's done and talked about in talks. Uh, she's done things like Botanigard and Bioseries. I don't think she formally tested VET52. Basically, the take uh, home message from her stuff is that the EC formulations seem to work better than the wettable powders. Mm -hmm. And that would hold true for MET52, right? Because it's also an OD, which it has like an oil dispersion formula. So that seems to be the trick that the ones with oils in them seem to work better. Um, and uh, But again, it might depend on your greenhouse. We found MET52 worked better up here but we have lower humidity in the winter and fall, um, uh, like lower growing temperatures often. So um, definitely experiment on your own farm. Wonderful. And then speaking of temperatures, what are the set points in your greenhouse November through February? Yeah, for Mandevilla, it's a bit tricky. So uh, usually it's set a, a sort of late summer, early fall to be somewhere between 20 to 25 Celsius. But then usually you want to hold the mandevilla anywhere between 14 and 18 degrees Celsius. So they put on slow growth over the winter and then sort of explode in growth in the spring to be ready for sale around May in Canada. So that becomes the challenge to using not only arthropod biocontrol agents, but also microbial controls. Because remember, entomopathogenic fungi are also alive and have low and high temperature ranges. Um, so that's why this year we pushed that temperature. We actually kept growing the mandevilla at, I think, 18 to 20 degrees this year so that um, we could still use some of those tools. So again, some of those production changes that I know growers are sometimes hesitant to make when it's an IPM problem, sometimes the production things can be the secret to making your IPM program better. Thank you. Okay, this is a question about those trap crops. So how can you grow the alyssum without attracting thrips that might be hanging out elsewhere? And that is a very good question. Um, we were lucky that this farm I was working on had five different locations. So their propagation facility was only doing propagation and um, crops that weren't susceptible to Thrips Farvis Finus. So they were able to do that. If you didn't have a space like that that could be separate, you could try using that landscape or strawberry cloth to keep the Parvus Finus off of them. But you'd have to basically do that from seeding through to when they were ready to be trap plants. Let's see, uh, why do you use spot sprays? Any special pattern? Uh, so the spot sprays would be by, by variety and it goes back to what I mentioned before is this thrip seems to really prefer certain varieties. Um, it seems to be more attracted to them and reproduce at higher rates on them. Um, so those ones like that one graph I showed where the green line was just like whoop, off the graph and all the other ones were sort of bunched together. That white variety was just like the bane of my existence for the past two years. So if we found if we sprayed just that one, 
then we could use other IPM tactics successfully and those varieties that were less susceptible. Um, so that's what I mean by spot sprays, because that when you have, uh, when you spray part of your population, but the, the rest unsprayed, the susceptible ones um, will mate with the resistant thrips and you'll lower resistance levels overall. But if you keep spraying farm wide every single time you spray, that's the, basically spraying often and everything is how we create resistant insects in the lab if we are interested in looking at resistant like biotypes, so. Cool, thank you. Yeah, it's really important to keep those rotations and different techniques. Okay, let's see. In your biotest program, one, can you say more about washing the plants with heavy watering? Did that remove just the adults? Yeah, it might have just removed the adults because like I said, those larvae are pretty sticky. Um, that was a trick I got from Judy Colley from Plant Products because she actually used to work for the Niagara Butterfly Conservatory when echinothrips were the biggest pest on the scene back in the day. And obviously in a butterfly conservatory, you can't spray chemicals. <laughs> oh. like the so they found that sometimes just literally washing the echinothrips off the plants worked. So that's why in this experiment, when we were putting a lot of money into our biocontrols, we didn't want to spray. And we did find that worked. And that has been a question in my mind of um, on our farm, we were doing sprenches of the MET 52. So like a spray and a drench. Um, so I think part of the reason it might've worked well for us is potentially we are washing some of the adults and larvae into the soil where then the spores of the MET 52 could get to them. But then Judy was also using MET 52 with just a foliar spray um, in the other facility and it was working well for her too there. But sprenches might be a secret to partially controlling these threats. Um, do you know of any work that's been done on roses? Uh, I don't. I do know it's on the potential host list. So far, we haven't seen um, Parvus minus jump onto roses up here. We had one facility that had it on winterberry, and they grow some roses too, and they didn't get transfer. So we'll just have to, you know, cross our fingers and hope we don't see it in that crop. <laughs> I hope not. I know. <laughs> Let's see, um, should we worry about the species in South America greenhouses, like on Rosa's Carnations, Elstermeria? I think so, because um, like I said, it's already present in Guatemala. So I don't know if it's been found in other countries in South America, uh, but it has a very broad um, worldwide distribution and in a lot of um, warm countries. So I do think that is a risk. So yeah, it's time to start putting up, if you don't have thrips proof screening up, you know, maybe it's time to screen your greenhouses, things like that. Because I do think in the North where it doesn't overwinter and we do have our greenhouses screened, a lot of them, I think that's a huge benefit for us. Sure. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question unless we have any more come in. So let's see. Um, why don't the mites seem to work for this pest? We just don't know that yet. Um, I think there's going to be some papers coming out of uh, Belgium that might help explain that. Uh, on the Mandevilla, I think part of it is they really don't like the plant. Um, when we put them on at really high rates, we can never recover them back. Um, and and BioB was super helpful in that work. We did mite sachets where, you know, the huge numbers are released week after week. And then we also, out of desperation, sort of like blew them on using a mite blower. And still after like a week, we couldn't recover any. So I think it's something about that slippery, glossy, you know, leaf. Um, but like I said, there could be something about the Thrips Parvus finest because of that, how jumpy it is. Maybe it's just too fast for our predatory mites. And like I said, I saw that one talk um, uh, at an international conference where a researcher from Belgium, or uh, sorry, the Netherlands was talking about how she saw thrips parvus finus actually eating predatory mite eggs. So it might oh be like a whole God. bunch of factors where the mites are just like, no, peace out, I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, we're not the tool for this job. Yeah, yeah, exactly, we're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we had another question. Um, what type of damage um, do you see on winterberry? Uh, winterberry looked pretty similar to what we see in crops like mandevilla, so the, the twisted um, growing points, and also some discoloration as well. Like in, in Scheffler from afar, you can see that the, the tip of the crop is starting to yellow, and you think, oh, maybe that's a disease or a nutrient deficiency, and then you walk up and you're like, nope, that's 
you know, from their second image. So yeah, some, some twisting of the growing points, leaf malformation and some discoloration. Cool. All right, well, those are all the questions that have rolled in. So we're good, oh, thank you. Great, you guys know where to find me uh, on the blog or email me at sarah.jandrisic at ontario.ca if you've got any questions. And like I said, we're gonna, I've made a dedicated Thrips Harvest Finest page on my blog and linked to a whole bunch of resources. So hopefully that can help with any other questions you guys might have. Cool. Oh, wait, oh, we got, we got a couple more that came in here last minute, but so we've got sure. a couple minutes, so it's okay. Um, on the, back to the winterberry, did you see any fruit damage on it? I don't think it had fruit by then. So they, they brought it in and they noticed the parvus finest right away. And then it went in the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Adios. <laughs> yeah. And then one last one. Um, any quick tips to ID parvus finest versus Western flower thrips? Uh, yeah, that's pretty easy. So the, the females are dark compared to Western flower thrips. So the, the first clue should just be the size, how dark they are. And when you tap them onto a pan, just how like <laughs> scattered they are. They remind me of Athena or Delodia. I did my master's on them and just, you know, trying to follow those around a pan while they're running away from you. That So that kind of speed. Um, so the only place you might get confused if you're looking at the males of Parvus finest, which are also yellow, and Western flower thrips. But again, it's the size difference um, is just incredible. So it would be like if you were looking at like a mini Western flower thrips male. Uh, so you probably shouldn't confuse them because with any thrip species, the, the female to male ratio is usually 60 to 40. So there's no, if you're tapping out only yellow thrips, it's not gonna be parvus finest. If you're getting a mix of dark and yellow thrips, then it probably would be parvus finest if you've got other cues like damage and the right host plants and things like that. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> and it looks like now we're good to wrap up. Great, great, thank you, Sarah. All right, thank you for joining us today for another session of AFE's GrowPro webinar series. Join us next month for Dr. Brian Shulker's presentation on managing peat shortages on Tuesday, March 19th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you can register at endowment.org slash forward slash GrowPro. While there, check out our past webinar recordings, other grower related resources and research reports available to you free thanks to our industry support. If you have also recently released, we also have the recently released schedule for 2024 Grow Pro webinars, and we encourage you to check them out and register ahead. We ask that you please complete the brief survey about today's session where you can suggest additional topics and help us continue to improve these webinars. Thank you again for joining us. Have a great day.